Welcome back to Rudy Giuliani's Common Sense. It's our purpose to bring to bear the principle of common sense and rational discussion to the issues of our day. America was created at a time of great turmoil, tremendous disagreements, anger, hatred. It was a book written in 1776 that guided much of the discipline of thinking that brought to us the discovery of our freedoms, of our God-given freedoms. It was Thomas Paine's Common Sense, written in 1776, one of the first American bestsellers in which Thomas Paine explained by rational principles the reason why these small colonies felt the necessity to separate from the Kingdom of Great Britain and the King of England. He explained their inherent desire for liberty, for freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the ability to select the people who govern them. And he explained it in ways that were understandable to all the people, not just the elite. Because the desire for freedom is universal. The desire for freedom adheres in the human mind and it is part of the human soul. Today we face another time of turmoil, of anger, very serious partisan division. This is exactly the time we should consult our history. Look at what we've done in the past and see if we can't use it to help us now. We understand that our founders created the greatest country in the history of the world. The greatest democracy, the freest country, a country that has taken more people out of poverty than any country ever. All of us are so fortunate to be Americans. We're not a perfect country. They weren't perfect men and women, and neither are we. But they did it better than anyone else, and that has to be our goal, to keep America a leader. But a great deal of the reason for America's constant ability to self-improve is because we are able to reason. We're able to talk, we're able to discuss, we're able to analyze, we're able to apply our God-given common sense. So let's begin. Today, we're going to continue with the trial. And we're going to concentrate on what would be the first two pieces of evidence, the first two witnesses in the trial. Now remember, what we're contrasting this is with the phony impeachment at the House of Representatives, the Democrats, purely part of them, brought against the president for non-impeachable offenses. That would be as if I tried to try someone for non-crimes. That's why it's entirely unconstitutional, completely illicit, and in my humble opinion, should be paid for by the Democratic National Committee because it's a, it's a political ad. The whole premise, I guess, of that phony political exercise is this theory that President Trump and I were trying to dig up dirt on poor Joe Biden, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I think the trial will prove that. On November 28th or so of 2018, when I first found out about the Ukrainian collusion, I wasn't thinking about Joe Biden. He was the furthest thing from my mind. I was sitting there in my office thinking about defending my client against the false Democratic charges of Russian collusion, charges that were manufactured, looks to me like somewhat in the White House, and charges that were manufactured certainly by Obama people and Democrats. And when I was told that there was evidence of Ukrainian criminality and corruption that made whatever was going on in Russia look tame, if anything got, went on in Russia at all, I met with uh, the gentleman who had the information. He gave it to me in a responsible way. And then I did what I was supposed to do as a good lawyer. I investigated the case to prove my client's innocence. And the mistake I made was I found, wow, did I find a scandal. Ooh. By the time this is all revealed, I predict Teapot Dome will be somewhere in the small annals of scandals. This is a scandal at the highest levels of both governments. It involves um, way beyond Joe Biden. 
we're going to concentrate on Joe Biden because I want to prove to you that what we were doing here was totally legitimate and required. It was a year and a half, two years before any election. It was before he announced his president. It was while the president was still being investigated. I actually got it finished before Biden ever announced. And frankly, I never thought Biden would run. Looked to me like he couldn't cross the street without help. But who knows? So today, with just two pieces of evidence, with just two pieces of evidence, I'm going to show you a provable case of bribery that if it doesn't outrage you, then there's something wrong with your sense of, uh, your sense of honesty. The background. Mykolo Zloshevsky was a minister in the government of President Yanukovych. And this, we're now going back to 2008, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, that period of time. Yanukovych was what we would call a pro-Russian Ukrainian. He was favorable toward Putin and occasionally would make overtures to the West. He had ministers and they were called Yanukovych's uh, mafia because the thing they all had in common was they were stealing from the government and laundering it, much of it through Privat Bank. Sloshevsky was no different. He held several ministries, ecology, environment. But what he did during the time he was in office was he awarded his own company licenses for oil and gas, and very lucrative ones. And his company was operated by his partner, a gentleman named Mykola Lisson. And his company was uh, housed actually in Cyprus. So in the very act of getting money into the company, he was laundering it out of Ukraine. So um, during that period of time that he had to steal like that, the estimates are that he stole about $5 billion. Uh, not the most, by the way. Yanukovych, in one deal, did $7.5 billion, and that was just one deal. Well, all of a sudden, the revolution of dignity happens. It really begins in 2013. 2014, it breaks out. Happens quick, like these revolutions always happen. And the uh, Yanukovych mafia is basically thrown out. They all run away. Yanukovych goes to Russia, where Putin takes care of him. Zloshevsky goes to, I think it's Switzerland. But remember, don't feel sorry for them. They go where their five billion is stashed, or their seven billion, or maybe the poor ones two billion. So the Yanukovych mafia goes around the world. However, all of a sudden, a new 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 government's coming in. And the new government's real angry at the old government, and the new government finds out they have $800,000 in the bank, I've been told. Can you imagine that? I, I, I think that's true. I haven't, been able to, I haven't been able to completely verify that. I will try. But they sure as heck have almost no money because these guys were taking out $7 billion and $10 billion and $5 billion. Zloshevsky, five. So Zloshevsky's now really afraid. He's sitting there. He's basically in exile. He's got his business. He's got his five bill, but now noises are getting made that they're going to come after his business and they're going to come after his money and they're going to bring a lawsuit against him in London and they're going to come after him here and there and there and there. And uh, he's going to be down to being maybe just a millionaire. And then President Obama does Zloshevsky the favor of his life. He names Joe Biden the point man for Ukraine. What that means is Joe's going to be in charge of handing out the billions and billions and billions of dollars to rebuild the country. And he's going to try to make the country less corrupt, which of course turns out to be a hilarious joke because he makes it more corrupt. But we don't know that at this point. Zloshevsky hears about Joe Biden. Zloshevsky's a smart man. And he says, I got to have somebody who's more powerful than Poroshenko to protect me in case they want to come after my company and my money. And my savior is Joe Biden. So, in ways that we will show you through intermediaries, he makes a deal with Joe. This is the first bribe. The deal is, you protect my company, I get you a lot of money. We know one way clearly, and that is hiring Joe's son, who is um, obviously not qualified for the job, to be on the board and paying him between five and eight million dollars. There's other forms of money sent to him that we will develop over the course of this trial, which I think you'll find even, well, probably not more shocking, but just 
as uh, shocking. So basically, what this bribe starts out as is, this is for, for Zoshevsky to protect his business against being taken by the government of Ukraine. Now, why do they pick Joe? You're going to find out a lot of reasons why, but I don't think you and I uh, really knew Joe Biden. Like going back to his Delaware days and his family's been monetizing uh, Joe's public office for years. Uh, his brother James, his younger brother, Hunter. I mean, this little scheme, they sell Joe's office and they make thousands and then Joe says, I don't know. This little scheme was going on for a long, long time. It became worldwide when he became vice president and he got the job of point man because everywhere Joe was a point man, the Biden family enterprise took in now millions. And we'll go through all those too, but let's just stick with this one. But no reason why Zoshevsky, a man of the world, wouldn't know what we didn't know that um, the Biden family was in it for money and for big money. So we heard the tape last week. We heard Joe say on tape, you're going to get rid of the prosecutor. And if you don't get rid of the prosecutor, you're not going to get your loan guarantee that you desperately need. As I pointed out to you then, that alone is the crime of bribery. We don't need any more. That's it. It has to be corrupt. Got to add a little evidence that he knew about his son being under investigation. You'll see there's a pile of it. So you could kind of do this on one tape and lots of documents. Three elements to the crime of bribery, once again. Offering something of value to affect public office, doing it corruptly. Something of value, a loan guarantee, affecting public office, firing the prosecutor, corruptly getting the son. And remember the first bribe, and Zloshevsky, and Zloshevsky's company, and Soros' company, and, 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 out of trouble. So there's plenty of corrupt ways. But now uh, we also have witnesses. And the first witness, if I were doing this at a trial, would be a man named Victor Shokin. On January 23rd, uh, 2019, I interviewed Mr. Shokin by, by uh, Skype. And um, you're about to see his testimony. And he said pretty much the same things, both in the testimony he gave me uh, during that Skype, that he was fired because Joe Biden didn't want him investigating Burisma and, and Hunter Biden and Zloshevsky, uh, and that he held back the money unless Poroshenko did it. He'll give you a whole history of how he was harassed before that. I'm going to tell you something else that's very surprising. And uh, we'll hear it from him. So let's take a short break. And then when we come back, you'll be listening to my questioning of Victor Shokin, which took place a few months ago live in Kiev. Of course, on tape now, but live then. For those of you who know me, in addition to law and politics, I'm passionate about the Yankees, baseball, football, all sports to watch, golf to play, history to read, opera, classical music to listen to and watch, and cigars to relax and socialize. And I have very definite opinions on the best cigars for the right time and the right place but the revolution in cigars took place in the 1990s. Most cigars then were machine made with foreign ingredients. Now it's just the opposite. Most are hecho a mano, man-made, and all organic, natural, and premium. This revolution was led by one man and one man alone and his magazine, Marvin Shankin and his Cigar Aficionado magazine. Marvin had been rating wines quite successfully for Wine Spectator magazine, and he brought the rating system, Wine Spectator, to Cigar Aficionado. The first cigars rated in the 90s were soon gone, quick. Even now, the first thing I do when I get my Cigar Aficionado edition is I immediately go look at the ratings. You know, I go look for 92, 93, whoo, 94, and I go try them. This quality comparison system revolutionized the cigar industry and quality rose to the top. 
Then there's the Cigar of the Year edition. 25 selected, only one number one. The top ones are going to be hard to get. So subscribe to Cigar Aficionado right now through the link on our website. And then go get the ones that are left or order them and smoke them. And see if you agree with the ratings and let me know. Sometimes I do agree. And when I don't, I let my opinion be known to Marvin. He listens very, very intently. And then he says to me, Rudy, stick to the law. Also, along with Rated Cigars, Cigar Aficionado has articles on politics, sports, interesting profiles. And Marvin also has Wine Spectator, which I mentioned, and a Whiskey Advocate. So if you like wine, bourbon, scotch, vodka, etc., it's a great guide to the best quality. Subscribe now to Cigar Aficionado through the link on our website. <laughs> You're going to really enjoy it. It's a great read. Thank you. Oh, you're back. <laughs> I won't tell you the cigar of the year. Gotta go get it. So now, it's time for us to hear from our first witness, Victor Shokin, who will give us the, what I would call the background and, and, and the beginning of all this in his own words. And uh, this will be corroborated by lots of other people, but this is the first witness and a, very, and a very important one, the former prosecutor general of Ukraine, uh, Victor Shokin. So this is a, um, a few questions to Mr. Shokin. He spent two days with us, so I know he's quite tired, and I know he's been very, very generous with his time. So I'm going to do this quickly as a summary of what you testified to. Несколько вопросов мы знаем, вы уже утомились. Вы два дня провели с нами, поэтому я постараюсь очень коротко суммировать все, о чем мы говорили. First of all, Mr. Shokin. Uh, you were the prosecutor general of uh, Ukraine from what date to what date? What were, the, what, what were your... Прежде всего, в какие даты вы были генеральным прокурором в Украине? С 10 февраля 2015 года по 3 апреля 2016 года. Till April the 3rd, 2016. And when you came in, and when you came into... When you came into that office, there was already a, a case against Burisma. Is that correct? Когда вы вступили в должность, дело Бурисма уже было в рассмотрении. Да. Yes. And the case involved money laundering, abuse of power, um, some other, there were six, five or six cases, isn't that correct? Uh, Mr. Shogun, it was not just one case, it was a number of cases. Правда ли то, что там было на самом деле целая группа дел, которые можно категоризовать по некоторым направлениям? Ну, дело в том, что там действительно было очень много дел, но эти дела, дела, дела представляли единое целое. Они касались буризмы разных направлений незаконной деятельности, но одной организации буризмы. Actually, yes, there were quite a few particular uh, separate uh, investigative cases, but they were all concerning one company. That's why the, uh, they were combined into one investigative And the ba case. I mean, the, just to simplify it, the basic problem with Burisma is that Mr. Zloshevsky, who owned it, had been a minister of the government. Мы правильно понимаем, что основная проблема была в том, что Господин Злочевский, который является владельцем, одновременно был министром в правительстве Украины. Да, действительно, он был министром, и действительно, используя свое служебное положение, он получил или взял себе, незаконно взял себе, по-моему, 7 или 9 разрешений на добычу газа. Absolutely, yes. While being a minister in the cabinet of ministers, he illegally issued to himself nine uh, licenses for mineral resources, you know, exploration. He, he, did, you, did he say illegally? Незаконно. Незаконно. Я сказал незаконно. Nine licenses. Hmm? Nine licenses. 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 N
И примерно в это же время господин Злачевский покинул страну. Ну, страну он покинул раньше, еще покинул страну в 2014 году. No, he left Ukraine uh, much earlier in 2014. Когда он покинул страну, был ли он под подозрением о том, что он украл большое, много денег? Да, он, он, ему вменялось незаконное обогащение отмытие денег добытых преступным путем. Yeah, he was incriminated with uh, unlawful enrichment, money laundering. And then there came a time in which he made appointments to his board, uh, particularly Devin Archer and Hunter Biden. И в какой момент произошло назначение новых uh, представителей в, в совет директоров, особенно Хантера Байдена и Дэвида Арчера. Ну, насколько я помню, это было в апреле 2014 -го года. As far as I could recall, that was in April 2014. When was his father, Vice President Joseph Biden, appointed or, or named by President Obama the point man for Ukraine? Вы помните, когда отец Хантера Байдена, Джо Байден, был назначен Обамой? представителем по Украине. Точно я не помню, но насколько мне память если не изменяет, это было либо в конце 13-го, либо в начале 14-го года. I can't tell you for sure, but as far as I remember, that was end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Before Hunter Biden was appointed to the board. Перед тем, как Хантер Байден был назначен Да, конечно. Definitely, yes. So, as you can see, Hunter Biden and, and Devin Archer were not appointed to the board until after Joe Biden was named the point man for uh, Ukraine. And um, just took a break here because I want to emphasize the following point, which is going to be emphasized now when we go back to the video, which will show the great and vast power that Joe Biden had over the country of Ukraine. So let's go back to the video. And part of Vice President Biden's job was to grant uh, loan guarantees to help и with the terrible fiscal problem. Часть работы Джо Байдена была обеспечение финансовых гарантий для Украины от имени США. Да, конечно. Он, у него вообще, значит, дело в том, что, насколько я знаю, то Джо Байден, в его компетенцию входила все, вся деятельность по Украине, независимо от финансовых гарантий, все что угодно. Well, as far as I know, uh, the competence of Biden included anything connected with Ukraine after he was nominated We're talking about Obama, Joe Biden. including, yeah, Joe Biden, including the financial guarantees which the US was considering. And when Hunter Biden was named to the board, did he appear to have any qualifications for being on the board? Когда Хантер Байден был назначен членом Совета директоров, есть ли информация о том, что он располагал необходимой квалификацией? Нет. У него не было квалификации вообще никакой. Вы же знаете, что если посмотреть на его автобиографию, и что он, что он делал, то он просто наркоман, алкоголик. Well, и obviously, he was not qualified to be a member of the board. We know his biography, he had problem with alcohol and narcotics and definitely not enough education to be on the board. Did, didn't he also have, uh, wasn't he, did, were you aware of the fact that he was dismissed from the Navy for failing a cocaine test, a drug test? Вам известен тот факт, что его уволили из военно-морского флота США, он не прошел тест на конечно. Of course, we are aware of Well, it's quite clear that... Uh, Part of Joe Biden's job was giving out billions, which made him awful powerful. And, and uh, he basically, according to uh, Shogun, had pretty much plenary authority over, over Ukraine. So if you were worried about Poroshenko coming after your business, this was the guy who could stop him, particularly if you knew that he was involved with his brother in a shady contract in Iraq and involved in other sh uh, shady deals with insurance companies and banks and I mean, we weren't dealing, you know, with uh, with a guy that was an uh, 
Well, let's say a guy that was clean. So you also see uh, how, how very quickly he answered the question, did Hunter Biden have any qualifications for board? I think you all know the Russian word, niet. And you can see the, 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 the grin on his face like, are you kidding me? So we have a man appointed to a board that he has no qualifications for, for which he's getting somewhere between 5 and $8 million for what is a no-show job. There's got to be another reason for it. The other reason is quite clear for Joe Biden's protection. And we're going to see now how and when this Loshevsky called in what he, pay, what, he, what, he pay, what he paid for. So let's go back. Tell you where the pressure, did, did President Poroshenko uh, tell you that he was getting direct and intense pressure from the U.S. administration uh, and Joe Biden? Поделился ли президент Порошенко с вами информацией, что его в свою очередь прессует посольство США и Джо Байдена? Нет, Джо Байдена, посольство я не знаю, а Джо Байден точно. Uh, I'm not sure about the embassy, but definitely Joe Biden, that, that he conveyed to me. So now I believe that you've heard the gravamen of the crime. Uh, very, very simply, while um, he was investigating the case, all of a sudden he started to hit pay, pay dirt. And I told you the month of February would be extraordinarily important. Well, it was extraordinarily important, as Mr. Shokin points out, because on February 2nd, and I think I have the right dates here. I hope I do. I tried to get them right because last time I was a little unclear. On February 2nd, he executes an uh, arrest, Mr. Shokin does, executes an arrest with another man who's going to be testifying later, Mr. Kuliuk, and they seize the business. Well, that's a pretty draconian step, which would frighten Soloshevsky right to hit the core, because it means your business could be gone, and after all, this is what he's fighting to keep. Meanwhile, they're going after his money. Uh, so this is about the time you would call in the favor, the bribe. You know, Joe, you're going to protect me. Now this guy's coming after me. The president had been trying to back Shokin off for about four or five months, as you heard Shokin testify. Slowly, because Biden had been complaining since December that he was getting too close to the kid. Uh, but now all of a sudden, there's not a shot not just at the kid, but at the big man that has the, you know, that has the billions. All of a sudden, you're going to see in this month the following. You're going to see three calls, February 11, February 18, February 19, between Vice President Biden and Poroshenko. Wouldn't you like to get the transcripts of those calls? Do you think with Burisma having just been arrested and with something else happening that I'm about to show you, do you think it's possible that they were talking about the Burisma case? Because right in the middle of this February 2016, the arrest on the 2nd, the telephone calls on the 11th, the 18th, and the 19th, between Biden and Poroshenko. Poroshenko getting really angry and livid at Shokin. This comes into the office. This is also February of 2016. And uh, here's a smoking gun. This is a report from the government of Latvia that lays out stone cold money laundering transaction in which Hunter Biden and Devin Archer participated. This is money that goes from, from uh, originally uh, Ukraine. It goes to a company called Wirelogic Technology AS in Belize, disguised as a loan agreement, because this turns out to be payments to board members, by the way. Then it comes out of there through Latvia. It goes to a company called Digitech Organization, LLP, which is a uh, United Kingdom company. Again, loan agreements. And then from Cyprus, it kind of goes across the ocean. So we see the amount of money that goes to, um, to Mr. Kwasanuski. It's over a million dollars. We see the money to Mr. Apter, to a couple of others. But if you look at this carefully, and, you know, they'll put it up on a screen for you. You'll see that there's something strange about this. They don't show the amount of money for Devin Archer, and they don't show the amount of money for 
Hunter Biden. Everybody else has a million, 300,000, but nothing for them. Here's the uh, Russian version of it. I'm very proud of myself because I translated these green things myself with a, I rec- highly recommend it with, a, with, a, uh, with an app on an iPhone. So it, so it says here, like, um, it says here, there's a total of $14,665,982 uh, was, was uh, laundered uh, and it ended up in Burisma Holding Limited, Cyprus. And then, um, and then about a million nine went to Digitech. And then it all gets funneled out. Alan Apter gets uh, 302,000. Alexander Kwasanowski gets 1.1 million. And then you just see Devin Archer and Hunter Biden. In case you're making it up, I think I'm making it up. You can also see their names. You know, they actually spell the same way in Russian. So how, how come they didn't fill in the money for, for these guys? Yeah, you, 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 know what, you know what the prosecutor's office was told? The American embassy told them not to give the amounts that went to Hunter Biden and to um, Devin Archer. Getting a lot of protection for the VP son. Also, you're going to see connected to this as the evidence unfolds, conversations in the State Department trying to protect Burisma, conversations all around the Obama administration trying to protect this, this corrupt, scummy situation. This is corruption, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't government. This is corruption. This is what you call selling out your oath of office for 24 pieces of silver, except it's a lot more money than 24 pieces of silver. This is selling out the United States of America. Here's the organized crime chart attached to it that the Latvians send, including Hunter Hunter Biden. This is a disgrace to our country. You know the biggest disgrace? That this isn't being investigated. But we'll, we'll get into that. So these are the documents. That's the testimony. And that's why he got fired in February of 2016. He raided the office. He got a stone cold money ordering transaction. Biden's on the phone with him three times. Biden, in his own words, forces him out of office. And, um, and they tell you that this was debunked. Liars. And they tell you there's no proof. What did I just show you? Proof. Liars. And why are they covering it up? Because you're going to find out there's a lot more involved in it than just uh, Mr. Biden. A lot more. So, let's now deal with something that has been brought up about Mr. Shokin that we should deal with. And that is, oh, you can't believe Mr. Shokin because Mr. Shokin's corrupt. By that standard, I'm not trying to be funny now, but by that standard, uh, it'd be tough getting witnesses in Ukraine at that level. And uh, Biden was not exactly uh, so worried about corruption when he was dealing with Poroshenko, who was the biggest thief in Ukraine, or his, uh, or his prime minister, who was just as big a thief, who he never asked for them to leave. How come of all the corrupt people, the guys who were sending 20 million to the Clinton Foundation, the ones who were ones who were laundering illegal campaign contributions to Clinton. How come the guy he picks on is this this, this guy Shokin? So let's let's listen to this testimony by Shokin about just how corrupt he is. Of before you got to the point where Mr. Poroshenko told you that you you had to resign. How many times did he, the president Poroshenko, how many times would you say he complained to you? Вы не могли бы дать примерно вот оценку, сколько раз с момента, когда начались эти намеки и просьбы до вашего увольнения, сколько раз Порошенко пытался вас как бы? Ну это было неоднократно, я не могу сказать. Ну вот он говорит три, четыре, пять. Может, не, ну раз пять, наверное, шесть, может семь. You see, не сказать сложно. Five, six, seven, more than five, definitely. It was not. And then there, then there came a time, if I'm reading your affidavit uh, correctly in the pr- prior, prior statement, um, 
I was forced to leave office under direct and intense pressure from Joe Biden and the U.S. administration. In my conversations with Poroshenko at the time, he was emphatic that I should cease my investigations regarding Burisma. When I did not, he said that the U.S. via Biden were refusing to release U.S. dollars one billion promised to Ukraine. He said he had no choice, therefore, but to ask me to resign. Do you remember that conversation with him? Мэр прочитал часть вашего заявления о том, что поскольку Байден увязывал предоставление инструмента американского на миллиард долларов с вашим увольнением, у Порошенко не осталось никакого выхода, как, собственно, вас уволить. Вы об этом пишете. Ну, не совсем так. Там немножко и так написано. Это мне не осталось другого выбора, как уволиться, потому что уйдет страна, а я человек нормальный, понимаю, что деньги нужны. Almost the way it's written there. Yes. The fact is that I am as a patriot, uh, I was put in a situation where I have to quit so that my country gets that money. Совершенно правильно. Ты же, Митя, понимаешь, что уйдет война, нужны деньги, и это то, и то. Давай иди, потому что... Yeah, Mr. Shokin just adds that that conversation contained that you know that we are waging the war, we need the money, you just have to quit so that the country gets the money. Was that one conversation or more than one conversation? Это было одна, один разговор или тоже несколько подобных разговоров было? Не, ну, о деньгах, по-моему, раза два-три было о деньгах. Well, it was two or three times. Uh, mentioning the money, потому что so. дело в том, что надо понимать, что я не очень хотел увольняться, я не понимаю, почему я должен увольняться. Я yeah. должен понимать. Uh, he didn't want to quit. As you can see, Mr. Shokin did not want to leave his job. So any question about this being voluntary in any way, Mr. Shokin makes it quite clear that he did not want to leave his job. It's also important to clarify the date on which he was actually asked to leave because so many of these events happened in February, which I will explain to you in a moment. So let's go back and let's listen to what happened in February and also uh, the real reasons for the resignation and how it was made clear. Yes, that's it. And what's the date, your best recollection of the date on which Mr. Poroshenko finally basically asked you to resign because of the pressure from Biden. February. Когда был как бы уже дело шло к финалу и последний раз вы можете примерно вспомнить Порошенко уже сказал что все вам надо уходить. Я знаю точно. 2 февраля 16 года по нашим документам суд наложил арест на имущество Буризмы 2. Uh, I know exactly. On the February 2nd, 2016, the court order of, in Ukraine put arrest on Burisma uh, assets. Да. И прошло 3-4 дня, даже, может, даже меньше. Звонит, видишь, что ты там с этой Бурисмой снова творишь? Я говорю, что, ну, подъедь сюда, приезжаю. У меня опять... In three, four days I got a phone call from the president. Я же and... рассказывал это. Он же суммирует, помните? Так он же записывал уже это. Да, вы уже не сказали. 2 февраля 2016 года, я точно помню на 100%. Я знаю exactly that date, because that was the date when the Ukrainian court arrested the Burisma assets. When you say arrested Burisma, what, what, is that, what does that mean? Что значит арест активов? Арест имущества. Арест имущества. Там все, и машины арестовали, и землю. It means that... Сколько, uh, там, ну, uh, You can't dispose of it, you know. Я сейчас не помню там какие use именно, it, какое just, имущество. Uh, you know, uh, имущество Буризмы. И Злочевского, в частности. It was arrest for Mr. Злочевский uh, assets and Burisma company assets. It, это счета арестовываются, да? Я не помню, что арестовывали в этот раз, действительно. Потому что до этого сняли арест. Суд mm -hmm. снял mm -hmm. незаконно. Мы снова направили документы в суд, mm -hmm. и суд другого Печерского района mm -hmm. арестовал 2 февраля. Но обычные счета в этом случае арестовываются деньги. Да все арестовывается да? есть. Yeah. Вот я не, yeah. не знаю, как uh, Previously, uh, uh, another court unlawfully uh, lifted uh, the arrest, but then we reapplied as a general uh, prosecutor office. Uh, so Mr. 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 Zloshevsky would have been arrested if he was in Ukraine. 
Зелоскин был бы арестован, если бы он был внутри Украины находился, правильно? Я думаю, что да. Yes. So that should make it pretty clear why August of 2016 was such a critical month. The second, the arrest of Burisma. In the middle, there were court fights. It was reversed. It was put back again. Three telephone calls between Biden and the president. I don't think there's another month with three telephone calls. And then right in the middle of it, right smack in the middle of it, the Latvian government sends a notice to the Ukrainian government about a stone cold money laundering case in which Hunter Biden is squarely right in the middle of it. It's Burisma Holdings sending money to Wirelogic Technology in Belize. They disguise it as loan payments. It then goes to Latvia. It then goes to Cyprus. It goes to the Digitech Corporation. And then it comes out to several people. And if you look closely at both the English version and the Russian version, you will see something very suspicious. The other board members have the amounts of money they're getting listed. One million something, 300,000 something. In the case of, um, case of the vice president's son and Devin Archer, there's no money listed. We're told by the prosecutor's office. When they called and asked why, they were told the American embassy told them not to list the money. This is stone cold money laundering. Why this isn't being investigated by our government gives you a sense of the double standard that we're living with and the fact that uh, something's gone wrong in our uh, justice system because this is crying out for investigation. It's about as corrupt as it gets, as corrupt as it gets. Once again, February was the big month. February is the month of the arrest of Burisma, the court case on Burisma, Biden leaning on Poroshenko three times, Poroshenko constantly coming in to see, to see Shokin telling him he better stop, he better stop, he better stop, he better stop. The wire transfers come in, Hunter Biden clearly involved in it, and then Biden pulls the trigger. Tells him you're not getting your money. Poroshenko fires Shokin. And now, let's see what happens after he's fired. But the president made it clear to you that the real reason he wanted you to resign was because of the pressure from the U.S. administration and Biden. No, uh... Because otherwise they wouldn't get the $1 billion loan guarantee. Но вместе с тем президент объяснил, что реальная причина в том, что есть давление со стороны Байдена. Байден требует тебя уволить. Yeah, literally, Biden demands that you are dismissed. And over the, you know, next couple of weeks, we'll we'll play more of Shokin's testimony. These are the these are the key ones having to do with the bribe. With the bribe, there's more. I thought it would also be important to show you two other things very quickly about his testimony. First of all, this whole issue about his being corrupt. Um, there was a good deal of investigating done b about that. And let me, just, um, let me just let you hear his testimony about it, and then I'll show you the documents. Th thereafter, you were not involved in it, but you, from the outside, found out that... Um, Lutsenko was named to replace you. После вашей отставки вы, естественно, узнали, что назначили Луценко, когда его назначили. Я знал это раньше еще. I knew it before he was officially. And that the cases ultimately were dismissed. И то, что в конце концов дело Бурисма было как бы действительно. Дело было незаконно прекращено. Yeah, unlawfully uh, stopped. And Zloshevsky was able to come back. Uh, without any uh, pen penalties. И в итоге Злочевский имел возможность вернуться в Украину без всякого наказания. So he benefited. He benefited from this bribery as well. То есть Злочевский получил выгоду от этой взятки. Ну конечно. Of course.
Do you know? Do you know uh, if um, if Sloshevsky paid uh, President Poroshenko any money for this? Может ли что-то сказать о том, что, к примеру, Злочевский мог заплатить что-то президенту за это, эту ситуацию? Я не знаю. Ага! You caught me cheating! This is my app. And you know what this says? This says from the ministry first it looked like mystery from the ministry of the home affairs of Ukraine, information department Shokin Viktor Mikhailovich got his birth date. Oh my goodness. He's he's never been arraigned. He's never been charged. He's never not paid a debt. He's never been convicted. Oh man, this guy must have been no criminal record. No evidence of an investigation. Gee, could Ivanovich have been lying? What do you think? She lied about that too? Wow. Now let me tell you another thing about good old Victor, who has um, a clean record, no convictions. If he were involved in corruption, he'd have been charged with something. When these phonies, when these lying Democrats when these people use the NGOs of Soros to destroy the reputation of a person, they never even make specific charges. Like, he's not charged with taking a bribe, like Poroshenko is going to be charged with taking anywhere from 10 to 100 million. He's not charged with taking a bribe like Biden, who got, what, five to eight for his son, another 900,000 at least for lobbying. And it's growing, it's growing. Wait until we get to Konstantin Kuljuk. Uh, they're charged with corruption. Not proved yet, but they're charged with it. He's not charged with anything. 50 or so years, not charged with anything. I got to tell you, I met the guy, spent a lot of time with him. This guy's corrupt. He's not good at it. Yeah. И рассказывает, что я шоке никогда не привлекался к ответственности за коррупционное действие. This is national agency for preventing corruption says that uh, Mr. Shokin never during the existence of was uh, corrupt was uh, incriminated anything. And then finally we have visa number five document. Это что я не судим. Yeah. And what is that? He was never in court uh, incriminated. Это with, МВД with anything at all, not just corruption. So this is a certificate saying... From the Minister of you, Interior. From the Minister of Interior, you've never been in court charged with anything. Right. So the claim that you are corrupt, uh, Mr. Shokin, is another lie. То есть, утверждение о том, что вы коррумпированы, это очередная ложь. Совершенно правильно. Yes. So the, you've never been charged with corruption, Never been convicted of corruption, never been arrested for corruption. And you're not any, on any Никогда не list. привлекался, не был обвинен, не был. And do you do you even know if there is a corruption list in the embassy? Have you ever heard of that before? А uh, вы когда-то слышали о том, что в посольстве существует некий список коррупционеров? Я слышал, что есть в госдепартаменте, и я знаю, что господин Байден мне это внес. Uh, I'm not sure about the embassy, but I've heard that the State Department has a kind of list, and I was put into that list by Mr. Biden. Well, that's about enough uh, for today. I don't want to uh, quickly run through something that is of enormous importance, and that is the danger of this case. And that will be demonstrated uh, next time when Mr. Shokin uh, will testify about the attempt to kill him. And... Um, by poisoning, by mercury poisoning. Not an unusual way of doing it in that part of the world. I can remember when this happened to Viktor Yushchenko, and um, he was poisoned uh, shortly before the, I think, before the presidential election because uh, he was the only hope for a, um, what they believe would be an honest and, and uh, solid Ukraine. 
he was taken to the Rudolph Clinic. I believe he was treated by Dr. Corpin. And um, that same Dr. Corpin has uh, examined Mr. Shokin, and Mr. Shokin will take you through what happened. And um, just so you don't think this is a vast right-wing conspiracy. You know the vast conspiracy going on here? The corrupt Democrats who are covering up what might turn out to be one of the worst scandals in American history with our country being sold out in Ukraine and made a laughing stock of by these Democrats. That may turn out to be the conspiracy. But let's just stick to this one. I think we've done a pretty good job of proving the Biden family corruption conspiracy. But if you have any doubt, this is Dr. Corpin. I've had a translator from German. Next time when we come back, we'll show you the German too, so you can do your own translation. Primary diagnosis. Mercury poisoning. The doctor will go, the records will go into some detail as to how this could not have been accidental. The amount involved was life-threatening, lethal. The man has suffered permanent damage to his internal organs, and he's go- undergoing treatment for it. And um, this wasn't an accident. It happened in September of last year, just at the time that um, it was being revealed that the president of Ukraine was deeply involved in this. And there were articles in the newspaper that his house had been raided and that it was alleged he received a $100 million bribe as part of uh, fixing the Burisma case. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot more to come. You probably don't believe me if I tell you this is the tip of the iceberg. It is. I think we pretty solidly showed Biden's crimes, but there are a lot more to come. So, come back. We'll be with you very shortly with another episode. We'll continue with the uh, attempted uh, murder of Shokin, and then we'll go on to the seven or eight, nine other witnesses and the 12, 15 documents and tapes that we have that prove this case, oh, maybe five or six different ways. Thank you.